Hello everyone, welcome back, or welcome for the first time if you are new. Today is work in progress Wednesday, which means I'm going to ramble to you about a work that I have in progress, but it's not just for me to go off about my work, it is for you to share what you've got going on and for us to celebrate as a community our writing milestones and the fun and exciting creative endeavors that we all have going on. So today we are talking about a series that I started working on in 2020. You may recall me referring to it as Revolution Ascending, but I found that Forge of Futures was just less cringe, I guess. Uh, it's still a working title, but that is kind of the idea anyway. Forge of Futures will have six books, five of which will be novels, and one of which will be a compendium that talks about the different species, planets, and concepts that all make the, the story universe what it is. I want to do like a timeline and like picture art, picture art, <laughs> uh, drawings of the characters and all kinds of stuff. I spent about two years actually working on the world building for the series while working on the first book before I really solidly committed to like a full plot arc for the entire series. And truth be told, I still haven't figured out exactly what I want the ending to look like. Um, but you know, we'll get there. I have total confidence in my creative ability to craft a delicious and satisfying story ending for this one, and I have a feeling it'll come to me as I kind of reach that final book and the milestones for that book. The concept for this series initially came about while I was watching Star Trek and Star Wars, and I really wanted to follow a storyline that doesn't have like a human as the default normal character, and I really wanted more droids and non-human organic beings to take center stage, if you will, in the story. The story itself was then flavored by the rising anti-queer sentiment that seems to still be increasing, but was definitely becoming a lot more prominent in my city at that time. The first book follows three droids, Vi, Lila, and Blossom, who are just trying to survive on a planet in the Galactic Consortium. Um, this government really treats them like second-class citizens and when speaking to a fellow author about my story idea they use the word apartheid to describe the situation in the universe that i'm writing it's not as extreme in the book as it is in many real world apartheid regimes so i'm really hesitant to use that word regardless life is harsh and it doesn't take long before they're swept up in the growing dangers of simply being clocked basically as droids the Thruple is hardly of one mind about how to deal with the situation. One of them wants to escape the planet, thinking that it's just Tariv that's as dangerous as it is, that's growing in, in this sort of like fascist sentiment and hatred toward their kind. The other has joined an activist movement, believing that widespread action will bring the Galactic Consortium to heal. And the third, who is actually the hinge in this Thruple, is a kind-hearted do-gooder who is just incapable of seeing anything but the goodness in everyone. And she, Vi, actually ends up kidnapped, and things take a really dark turn. Lila and Blossom turn to the underground droid rights movement for help and find themselves swept up in an increasingly dangerous fight for Vi and for the safety of all droid kind. Through hardship, loss, triumph, and community, every character in this book experiences huge emotional growth, which is good because the more pressing danger the Double Walkers, again, name pending, I don't really know what I'm going to call them yet, but that's kind of their placeholder name, uh, they have just made their presence known by the end of the first book. And the droid movement has a lot of work ahead of itself uh, if it's going to actually survive this knockdown, drag out fight between the Double Walkers and the Galactic Consortium. And that's the end of book one. Cue Aradelos and Varus. Aradelos is a disgraced Battleborn class Galactic Consortium soldier who's been grappling with his new, much lower assignment as an Enforcer class soldier, cleaning up the dregs on the outer planets and collecting defectors for trial, basically. Uh, he hates it. <laughs> he went from being this big, like, super warrior, like, think Space Marines, to what he feels like is equivalent to just, like, a cleaning crew, basically. He's, he's a cop in the sense that he feels cucked, basically, by his government. Um, you know, he, he spent his whole life being trained to be this big, like, warrior on a crusade who can force compliance of planets and if those planets don't comply then he can he can 
carry out the Galactic Consortium's, um, you know, desire for extermination. And now uh, he's just kind of left, like I said, cleaning up the dregs of society on the outer planets. You know, lots of time and travel in between action. He hates it. <laughs> um, and his memories of the past really fuel his sense of rejection in the present. Um, so the tension between his desire to prove his worth and the reality of the cultural differences between him and his fellow enforcers is really palpable for him. A really key component to this, like understanding this dynamic, is that a part of being in the Galactic Consortium as a species is that you're required to give one third of your infants up to the Galactic Consortium for use as military members, as um, administrators in, in you know, their federation, uh, so on and so forth. And so they're raised, you know, as battleborn, as enforcers, as admin, etc. from a very, very young age to be the thing that they become. And there's culture around that. So the battleborn culture is different from the enforcer culture, is different from the admin culture, is different from the education sector culture, and so on. And so he just doesn't fit in. But it's not as bad as he thinks it is. He's in his head a lot. Um, and he is finally given like a probationary leadership position, which kicks off with some intense moments. Um, and then he begins to bond with uh, Varys, his pilot, um, who is, he's just another character who's really actually beloved by all and who has pretty high status, but he's chosen to exist on the fringes of Enforcer Society for reasons that become revealed throughout the story. So when Ari has some genuine concerns about a new foe that the Enforcers face, um, specifically his team faces on one of their missions down to a defector planet, Varys, the pilot, believes him, despite Enforcer leadership and the Galactic Consortium's dismissal of his hunch. So. Ari and Varys get into some like pretty ridiculous, I say ridiculous, but like severe, I guess is a better term, shenanigans. And things really don't go as planned. We learn why Ari is cast out of the Battleborn Regiment in the first place, and Ari and Varys find themselves in like literal mortal danger as the Double Walkers, you know, name pending, close in. This one has a lot different pacing than the first book. There's a lot more downtime, there's more emotional reflection, and some like really deep companionship between these two characters, Ari and Varys. And it's, it's then contrasted with these like exciting bursts of action and danger and battle. It's really meant to reflect Ari's sense of change and growth and development over time throughout the story. So when he feels like things are, are too slow, the story is going to feel slower. When he's experiencing this new sense of deep companionship and almost life partnership with Varys, he's, he's experiencing it very deeply. And so I want the reader to experience that. And then when the action comes, uh, it's going to come like a punch to the face. So there are actually three more parts to this story. Um, they explore Vi's perspective and the experiences of an immortal cyborg scientist who we initially think is a villain. And then there's like a shit ton of political intrigue uh, in the court of the Galactic Consortium in the final book. But I'm really going to leave you with like what I've given you for now. Um, the rest of it isn't as fleshed out. And also, you know, I feel like two, two book uh, synopses is probably good enough of a teaser. If you weren't interested in those, you won't be interested in the rest. But if you were interested in those, then you will. You will be interested in the rest. So that is Forge of Future's working title. Um, I would love to hear about your works in progress in the comments. And of course, I'll see you next Wednesday for another work in progress update on something entirely different that I've been working on for way too long. Happy Vlogoween, and I'll see you tomorrow. Hey there, thanks for watching today's video. In case you haven't heard, I recently released a set of new and old short stories through Storydown Publications' annual thriller anthology, Distant Tales. This year's publication is titled Distant Tales, Second Chapter, and I would love it if you would check it out. I did the editing and formatting on this thing, and I'm super proud of how it turned out. And of course, it has some amazing stories that will definitely get your blood pumping for the holiday season. As a side note, if you're an author who's looking for community guidance or publishing services, feel free to check out Story Den Publications. I work with them as an editor and formatter on a regular basis, and the founder, Tai Hakobo, is a close personal friend of mine. 
and I really believe in what she's trying to do. Her goal is really just to make indie authors' dreams come true at an affordable rate with high-quality services. So if that sounds like something you'd be interested in, check them out at the link below in the description. Thanks, and have a great day. Through soon.